So explain the dice. This was a, a you came up with this as kind of a speaking point. Uh, was it the first time in 1988 for that hearing or before? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was right after the 1988 hearing because of the misinterpretation that some people made. I, you know, when you talk about global warming, then when you have a cool day or a cool month or a cool year, then people think, oh, that must be a lot of baloney. But in fact. The problem is that global warming is relatively small compared to weather fluctuations. So all you can do is look for a change in the frequency of warmer than normal uh, times. And if you average over a season, then it's a little easier to see uh, anomalous temperature change. So what I did was make a one die which was supposed to represent uh, normal conditions, which was the 1951 to 1980 climatology. And for that period, the National Weather Service had defined uh, warm seasons, unusually warm seasons, as those which occurred 30 or 33 percent of the time. And unusually cold conditions are the, those uh, 10 out of the 30 years that were the coldest. So I had two sides of the dye, red for hot, two sides blue for cold, and two sides white for average. And my point was that by the end of the century, if in our intermediate scenario, scenario B, the frequency of warmer than normal seasons would increase to about 60, uh, 60 to 70 percent, so that made four sides of the dye red and one white for normal and one blue for colder than normal. So you can, so even after this warming, you can still get seasons that are colder than they were in the period from 1951 to 1980. And, uh, and by the way, this has turned out to be about right. It's now uh, 60 or a little more than 60 percent of the seasons um, are in the category that was warmer than normal in 1951-1980. Now when, does, when, did we, when would you have to paint a new face red? Um, I, that will depend on the scenario, yeah. but uh, um, I, I, I guess without looking at calculations that it's only of the order of another 10 or 15 years. I would have to look, it might be 20 years, I'm not sure. Yeah. Do you think people have largely misunderstood that this is kind of a, an odds changing enterprise, not fixing something? I mean, we're not fixing the climate system per se, right? Right. Well, I think that's not a hard concept for people to understand. But then it is a, you know, we'll have a very unusually mild winter, for example, and I notice relatives that I had in Minnesota, and people would think, boy, these guys were right about global warming when we had really warm winter with almost no cold weather a couple of years ago. But then a year later, uh, the winter was quite cold, <laughs> and so people do mis tend to misinterpret the unusual weather events, even though the chances of having that and the extremity might be related to global warming, but it doesn't mean that the warming is large enough to dominate over mm -hmm. natural variability. Well, I think the reason that we didn't really work on solving the long-term energy problem up until, well, we still haven't really begun to do it, is because of the role of special interest. The fossil fuel industry is doing fine, and they will continue to do fine even if there's a limited supply. In fact that causes the prices to go up and they make more money. Why should they? So if you look at um, the people in Congress who are arguing against uh, climate actions and against taking the steps that we would need in order for renewable energies to take over, which is where we have to go in the long run, you'll see that many of those Congress people are um, receive um, funding or campaign contributions from the uh, fossil fuel industry. I mean, first of all, you've got to make the scientific case that we are at a very dangerous point. If we don't uh, begin to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the next several years, 
and, and really on a very different uh, course, then we are in trouble. Um, the ice sheets are in trouble. Uh, many species on the planet are in trouble. But the other, the thing that I would really emphasize is that the problem is solvable. We can make the inevitable transition to renewable energies, but it requires a major initiative, and specifically it requires a national low-loss electric grid, a, a DC grid, a high-voltage DC grid, one which you should bury so that it doesn't, so that people don't object to the uh, impact on the, on the views, on the environment. And we can do that. The technology is actually available to do that. And we could do it in less than a decade. We could get the backbone of a national grid in place. And that would allow renewable energies, which are many of which are intermittent, uh, but which with a low loss grid, that's not a problem. And, and so how we, would you make the case? A grid is a, kind of a wonky, invisible thing. How do you make that case? Well, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's like, say, say in the national highway system in the 1950s, we decided on that, and, and, we, and we did it. And we could do this. Or it's like the, the moon program, which Kennedy uh, described. It's a simple concept, and the president who has, you know, the authority, a new president, could take that as um, his major, or at least one of his major actions, and he should do it uh, next year because we're running out of time. Because of the long life of CO2 in the atmosphere and the fact that we've got these sources uh, which we're not going to shut down suddenly, we're certainly going to have additional CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, if we would phase out coal except where we capture the CO2 by 2030, then because of the finite uh, volume of oil and gas, we could get back to 350 within 100 years, um, provided we didn't exploit unconventional fossil fuels. And what about the China question? What do we do? What can we do that's the most see, influential? China, China is inappropriately made a scapegoat in this case because what causes the climate change is not today's emissions, it's today's atmospheric composition. And we are primarily responsible for the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more than three times more than China, and actually on a per capita basis more than an order of magnitude more responsible. So to blame China and say we have to wait for them is, is nonsense. Oh, well, yeah, in the short term, we have to have a moratorium on new coal-fired power plants. And that should start in the United Kingdom, the United States, and Germany, in my opinion, because those three countries are the most responsible for the excess CO2 in the atmosphere on a per capita basis. And actually, it's in that order, the United Kingdom, the United States, and Germany, because the UK started on industrial revolution. Uh, mm -hmm soonest and mm -hmm. some of that CO2 is still in the atmosphere. Yeah. So, you know, so that's why I wrote a letter to the Prime Minister and to the Chancellor of Germany trying to convince them if one of us, if one of the three countries would take the first step, then probably we could convince the other two and then eventually the European Union and, and get the ball rolling. But we really need to stop building coal-fired power plants because they tend to sit there for 50 and produce CO2 for 50 or 70 years. Yeah. And uh, every day one of these big uh, plants will burn a hundred um, rail cars of coal. It's, right. it's an incredible amount. So it's citizens taking small steps to reduce their emissions will really be fruitless if we yeah. continue to build more coal-fired power plants. Do you um, do you have uh, do you ever wake up having regrets about step, stepping so far into the realm of policy and and messaging as opposed to just no, hungering no, down I, and doing no, your I only climate? regret that we haven't got the story across uh, yeah. as well as it needs to be. Um, and I think you know I think we're running out of time.